I hate to interrupt your conversation, but it is good to see you. It's good to hear you. And I think, I think the song of worship has already started in the fellowship of the saints. Amen? I think God loves to hear His people share together. He likes to see His people share in life together. You know, the thought of forsake not the assembling of yourselves, that was really said before we had Sunday morning services. He just likes to see His people together. Amen. Stand with us. We just want to come into this place with a song in our hearts, ready to bless and honor His name because He is everything. Do y'all believe that today? He's everything, and He's worthy of all that we can bring to Him today into this throne room. Let's open with Scripture. Let's read this together, Revelations 5. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Do y'all know he's on his throne today? Come on, give him praise. He's on his throne. Let's just bless his name. Lord God, we've come into your house today. We've come with a song in our hearts, Lord. This is yours. These are your people, Lord. And we pray that in everything we do, in everything that we say, God, you are honored and glorified in this place. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. You are worthy. Amen. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Lord, I'm done. 
overwhelm this place God you are the center of it all Lord. we place all our hopes and all things on you Lord you are our source of joy today you are our cornerstone we trust in you we trust in you God Jesus. come on let's just sing this together my hope is filled Trust. 
Put your life on him this morning.
worship today. Come on, just give him praise. He's worthy. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. He is worthy to be praised. Let's pray. Lord, we've come for no other reason than to worship you. We will worship you in song. We will worship you in the word. We will worship you in fellowship. For in the embracing and greeting of one another, there is joy exchanged in the Lord and strength imparted. May you be glorified in this time of worship today, we pray. And the people of the Lord said, Amen. 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 Give him one more hand clap of praise before you're seated today. Amen. We are so glad to see each and every one of you today. Thank you for joining us for Sunday morning worship on a holiday weekend. And I know the kids are out of school. Some are out Friday and tomorrow, and many are out tomorrow, and banks are closed tomorrow, and, and I, I guess the post office is closed tomorrow. I don't even keep up anymore. What I get in my mailbox I ain't worth walking in the mailbox to get. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but someone told me this morning that President's Day holiday tomorrow had been canceled. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, we don't have a president. So when we get a I didn't say that. They said that. And I, so anyway, if you're a guest, I don't ever get political. But I will tell you, we are honored that you would worship the Lord with us today. It does delight us to see new faces and whatever brings you here. If you're visiting, just visiting with family and friends, we're glad you're here. If you're looking for a church family to be a part of, we got a deal for you. You can be a part of some of the greatest people on the earth who love the Lord and would love you as well. Matter of fact, if you are a guest, stop by the Welcome Center when service is over. It's in the middle foyer. See our folks there. They have a gift they want to put in your hand and get acquainted with you. One of the things we are focused on right now is rebuilding community within the church after COVID. So many things had to be canceled and so many things had to just kind of be put on the back burner. And we are working real hard because what we do through the week affects Sunday. And what we do on Sunday affects us through the week. And so we want to make sure these are working together in harmony. We had a great men's fellowship breakfast yesterday. Over 100 men showed up to eat, and we had plenty of food. We did not run out of food. And we only had one get food poisoning, so that's pretty good. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, ladies, men cook. There had to be a problem, right? No, we had a great day. And... I see that feeding into today. Being together yesterday feeds into today. And so we have a lot of things going on that we need you to be a part of aside from Sunday morning worship. We have ladies' Bible studies and men's Bible studies that will be running simultaneously beginning March the 6th. Both groups will meet on Sunday night. And the ladies will also have opportunities throughout the week. I'll just leave that there. But we need you to sign up so that we can have an idea of how many to prepare for and whether or not you'll need child, child care. But I want to encourage you to be a part of that. We have softball and t-ball registrations underway. So you can be out in fellowship and recreation and practices begin in a couple of weeks. Need you to sign up. Our ladies retreat is scheduled May the 13th. Guess what? It's already full. Men, they can't wait to get away from you. But call the office and get on the waiting list because inevitably there's always someone who can't make it. And uh, so just get on the waiting list and see what happens. What are you telling us, Pastor? I'm saying it's important that you have connections with each other and that you grow together. It's just as important as Sunday morning and both minister to each other. So let's get involved, get the bulletin, it's online, find out what's happening. We'd love for you to be part of it. Let me, let me go here and I'll be done. You guys, you okay? I need to get y'all stools up here, don't I? So here we go. We opened the Family Life Center a couple weeks ago. If you're a member of this church and you're not taking advantage of that, you are missing a blessing. 
Tuesday night, they had 24 people out there playing pickleball. Now, I don't know if they thought it, we were giving away dill pickles or what, but they, I mean, they tell me they had a hoot hollering time. And uh, you ought to take a look. It is a beautiful facility, it is well managed, and uh, it's another opportunity for you to connect with people. Listen. We're not just looking for people to sit with us on Sunday. We're spending our lives together. We're spending all of our lives together. And we want our children and our grandchildren spending our lives with all of us. So get involved where you can. Don't worry about anything. The Lord has already won the victory over everything. And today he wears the victor's crown. You're my Savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. Let your power overflow. By your grace
the grave could not contain you, for you wear the victor's crown. give him praise today. Amen. He has overcome. Well, if you're physically able, we ask you to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. If you're not, we ask you to stand in your heart. The series is Generations Season 1. Uh, there'll be other seasons, and, and we're going to consider in this season the life of Abram now, soon to be Abraham. I first preached on the life of Abraham in 2009, 2010, and it kind of crossed over. Um, And I realized that was like 12 years ago, and I'm thinking, all right, I don't know where I'll be 12 years from now, and I don't know where you'll be 12 years from now when we want to do it again. So I'll just take my time today. Some of you may not be here then. I may not be here then. Let's live in the moment that we have. You'll find out today something I told you a few weeks ago. Abraham's been screaming at me. And my struggle today is to get all this in. So let's see. There's no football. Nobody cares about NBA basketball. I think there's a race today, but that's later. So let's see what the Lord has to say. Genesis 12, verse 10, the message title is Trust. And the first word is now. Now. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. All right, men, look at your wife and say, He's just like you. Yeah. This is when Sarai knows she's in trouble. He's paying her a compliment. (laughs) Because he says after that, Therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife. And they will kill me. But they'll let you live. So please say that you are my sister. That it may be well with me for your sake. And that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. And the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. They went to Pharaoh and said, you got to see this lady. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. 
and he, being Pharaoh, treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. But we started with now. Here we are. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my my wife. Now therefore, there's a new now, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him being Abram, And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And may the Lord add his anointing to his word. And don't let us miss anything you want to say today, Lord. We ask in your name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm captured by that first word. Now. It's Abram's new now. The text begins now. A new now has dawned in Abram's life. And the new now thus ends the previous now. Abram had had many previous nows. The the now when God called him to a new land, the now uh, of of getting stuck in Haran, the now of that call and covenant being renewed and reaffirmed confirmation. And all of these are great nows. But as our text opens, there's a new now in Abram's life. And it's a great reminder to us that our seasons of life or ever changing. Amen. Now you got to have lived a while to really get that. Because when you're just young, it all just blends over. And, but when you've lived long enough, you realize life is ever changing. And whatever now you are in today, be ready because there'll be a new now tomorrow. If you're in a difficult season, just hang on. Because this this now season that's difficult you, sooner or later is going to end. And there'll be a new now that will bring promise and hope. If you're in a great season of life, my advice to you is enjoy it. Enjoy every minute of those great seasons. Why, preacher? Because there'll be a new now one day. And what you were able to enjoy in one season, you may not be able to enjoy in another season. There's always a new now. Abram's new now is a season that is marked, according to the Bible, by a famine that has struck the land. A famine. The land is not producing food. The Bible characterizes this famine with one word, severe. It's not a mild famine. It's not a mediocre famine. A severe famine has struck the land to which God has brought him. It isn't just that the shelves at Publix and Food Lion and Walmart are running low of supplies. We've seen that over the last two years. It isn't that the supply chain is running slow and things aren't moving fast. It's much worse than that. It's the reality that there is no supply for the chain to carry. There is no food in the land. And so let's think for a minute. Here is Abram exactly where God has told him to go. Here is Abram exactly where God told him to go. And if there's any doubt, when Abram got there, God showed up and confirmed to him, this is it. 
This is where I want you to be. Your descendants will inherit this land. Here is Abram in the exact place God told him to go, doing exactly what God told him to do. And the first event of significance in this new now for Abram is, and a famine struck the land. And I believe Abram scratched his head, saying, I didn't see this coming. A parallel, it's kind of like this. It's the equivalent of you getting the dream job you've always wanted in the dream company that you've always wanted to work for. And you arrive on that first day with such excitement and you're so giddy and you get there early and you're the first one there and you go in and you go to the first meeting and here you are the first day on a new job in your dream company with your dream job and the first meeting and the announcement is made, we're going to have a layoff. (laughs) And you're thinking this is not what I signed up for. This was not in the brochure. I'm thinking Abraham has to be wondering, God, you didn't mention this. You didn't say anything about this. Not when you called, not when you renewed the call, not when you confirmed the call. I'm thinking Abraham probably did not perceive that his initial season in Canaan was going to be a season of famine. And this particular element links all of us, every one of us, to Abram's life. Because we are all going to enter into seasons of life with the perception life is going to be one thing and we are brought to the reality that it is something else. Amen. I'm going to preach better than you're going to shout today. I'm going to prophesy that. We all are going to go into seasons of life with perception, expectation. People have told us, when you get there, this is what it's going to be like. I've had people recommend vacation spots to me. I'm going to have a good time. I just sit there miserable. I don't care. They've, re- they've recommended vacation spots to me. told me how wonderful it was, how glorious it was. And when I got there, the perception was not the reality. Amen. It's the perception that's built by what other people tell us. Perception that's built by the sales pitch. Perception that comes actually from our own, from our own imagination. You have taken jobs with the perception of this is going to be the job of my dreams and a great place to work only to get there and find out. Perception is not reality. Kids go to college with the perception of what college life is going to be. It's going to be great. I'm not going to have a mom and daddy there to to tell me what I have to do and what I can't do and watch over my shoulder. I'm not going to have a little brother or little sister there to irritate me and take my stuff. And It's just going to be so wonderful. I'm going to be so free. That was the perception. Then they flunked out the first semester. Because they couldn't handle the reality. Who's with me? People go into marriage with the perception of what marriage is going to be. They have watched the Hallmark Channel. (laughs) Come on now. I got some men wanting to shout right now and they're so scared. You big chicken. They've watched that Hallmark Channel. Or she's read novels. Or they had this season of dating, also known as the sales pitch. Mm. Please bless me, Lord. And they go into this marriage with perception, but it isn't too long. They find out perception is not reality. Abram comes into Canaan. He's called by God. He's assured a possession of the land. He's promised blessings. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And yet, Abram's finding out 
perception is not reality. Let me give some universal truths. Be careful with your perception. Be careful. I'm not saying don't have ideas. I'm not saying don't have dreams. I'm saying be careful that you trade reality for perception. Be careful because perception out of control can create fantasy. And that's a danger. Be careful because perception can create fantasy and make you hard to live with. Mm. I didn't know she'd look at him right now, but she did. <laughs> Perception can create fantasy and make you hard to live with. We were talking between services. Steve Jobs had perception of what his company should be and what they ought to be able to accomplish. The problem is his perception was so large there were many people who couldn't work for him because that perception dwarfed reality. Be careful that you be guided too much by perception. Be careful becoming so blind to your perception that you in fact become blindsided to reality. Matter of fact, here's the dangers of perception. One, you'll find yourself being consumed by things that may or may not ever occur. You just had the perception they would. You will find yourself being consumed by things that may or may not ever occur. You just had the perception that they would occur. Worry is the perception that God is not going to do what I think he should do. Worry is the perception. I'm told not to worry, but the problem with worry is if I perceive God's not going to do what I think he should do or life's not going to turn out the way I think it should turn out, then I am prone to worry based on the perception. I'm taking my time. Bitterness is the perception that God didn't do what I thought he ought to do. And because he didn't do what I thought he ought to do, and life didn't turn out the way I think it ought to sure turn out, because I'm caught up in my perception, I open the door to become bitter. Selah. Jesus said this, don't take any thought about tomorrow. Take no thought about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Take no thought about what, what, what's he saying. He's saying learn to live in the now moment. And tomorrow take care of itself. There'll be a new now tomorrow and we'll take care of that tomorrow because the same God who is going to be with you today is the same God who's going to be with you tomorrow. So don't drift off aimlessly perceiving everything that has to take place next week, next month, next year. Live where God has placed you. Be careful with perception because you actually can get so consumed by perception that you miss reality. You can actually miss what God's doing because He's not doing what you perceived He was going to do. Send me a tape. Parents, be careful having a perception of what your kids should be. Because your perception should, could be, my kid's going to be a great athlete. And they can't catch a cold in the dead of winter. <laughs> I hate to tell you that. That's just... But if that's your perception, you might miss that while not being a great athlete, they really have a proclivity toward math. And could be a brilliant scholar. But, don't, but your perception can blind you to what is real. I've come to this pulpit with the perception that I'm going to preach a great message today. I got one, as we say, that is red hot. That's what the old timers called it. Oh, I got a red hot one. I got one, they're going to be on their feet. They'll be in the aisles. They will not want me to dismiss. They'll hang around the church and say, preach it again, preacher. And I have preached it as you sat there. (laughs) 
went home utterly miserable. And you've done the same thing with songs. So don't laugh at me. <laughs> Boy, we're going to crank them up today. Wednesday night, we shouted all over the choir. Come in here on Sunday. And then you get home, and a day or two later, you get a card or an email that says something like this. How did you know? And God really spoke to me. See, it's so easy to have the perception of what should be that you miss what really is. I know Abram had a perception, but that perception was not the reality. The second point that I heard in this text, thank you for letting me unbear my soul, is simply this. Sometimes you just do what you have to do. Amen. Sometimes you just do what you have to do. Now, you're immediately going to say, Preacher, that point doesn't sound very spiritual. And you're exactly right, it doesn't. But it doesn't sound spiritual because we live in this perception that somehow there's a spotlight right in front of us that guides every step and every decision and every process that we make. That there's always music playing from the heavens in our ears and we live in this constant spiritual euphoria. And that's not always the case. Sometimes life is a drudgery. And you just have to do what you have to do. Amen. Sometimes it's just a drudgery. Sometimes you're not living on the mountain. Sometimes there's not Kool-Aid coming out of the fountain. And you just got to get up tomorrow and do what you have to do to get through to another day. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. And I base that point on this. Abram has been called to Canaan. But Canaan is in the midst of a severe famine. Now this is the land that God promised him. This is the land where he built an altar and God spoke to him again. This is it. You're in the right place. This is where I told you to go. But the famine hits and the Bible says he travels down to Egypt. Because apparently there was food in Egypt. Now it's not probably the ideal thing to do. Egypt is not what God promised Abram. Canaan was. But Abram's a husband. He's responsible for a household. He's got servants and lots of food. And they're hung, lots of servants and lots of flocks who need food. And I'll tell you what, you stand there and look at the sheep till you start counting their ribs. And sometimes you just do what you have to do. Amen. Sometimes you just do what you have to do. So, so, so I'm praying about this message and I'm studying and I go to the commentaries because what they tell us in preacher school is you lay out your message and then you go to the commentaries to make sure you're right. So I laid out the message and I go to the commentary to make sure I'm right or at least on the right track and I come across some commentators who were crucifying Abram. Some commentators who were saying, they said, this is Abram's great failure of faith. This is Abram living in fear. This is Abram trying to run from his problems. And I actually put it down and looked, and, and looked at it and said, dude! That's what I say when I'm mad. Dude! You're not there. And you're not hungry. And sometimes, dude, you just do what you got to do. You're not there. You're not responsible for these people who are crying in pain. It's not your livestock and your livelihood that's at risk. Yes, he could have stayed in Canaan and hoped that it got better. Well, I just hope it gets better. But I heard General Jerry Boykin say this week, hope is not a strategy. Amen. 
Hope is not a strategy. They said, General, do you have any hope for what's going on in Ukraine and Russia? And his reply was quick. Hope is not a strategy. We need more than hope. We need a plan. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Now, because I'm going to take my time today, because there's no football, To those of us who love to play Monday morning quarterback with everybody's life. Mm. To those of us who have have appointed ourselves as commentators. And we're writing commentaries on everybody's life. And we love to say things like, well, they shouldn't have done that. And they shouldn't have went there. And what they should have done, and blah, blah, blah. That's Greek for blah, blah, blah. (laughs) To those of us who love to do that, here's my counsel. Stop it. You're not there. And you're not hungry. And you don't know what you would do if your babies were crying. You don't know what you would do if your livelihood was drying up in front of you. Sometimes you just do what you have to do. Amen. I sat in a room with pastors this week. There were about 16. We met at Florence Church, and they'd asked me to come down and talk to them. And we were talking about our, our, our COVID journey, all of our churches. And I listened to them, and they're They're struggling. I actually watched as tears welled up in their eyes and they began to weep. And they said things like, I have people who are still mad at me because we didn't have church. I have people who are mad at me because we, we, we said we need to wear a mask or we need to socially distance. I have people who've left me because of decisions that I made. And I sat and I watched them weep and finally I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, guys, stop. Second guessing yourself. Stop second guessing yourself. As long as your decision was made in the purity of I am doing what I think is best for my people based on the information that I have, then don't second guess what you did. Because sometimes you just do what you got to do. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us what to do when a pandemic hits. Yes, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But what do you do when if you come together, it's dangerous for everybody. Sometimes you just do what you have to do do amen I had two members I was talking to this week two precious people both of them have brain tumors and are about to have surgery at Duke Hospital one this week one the week after next and both of them in our conversations went to the same place pastor I know you haven't been seeing me lately but I know this surgery is coming And I'm just trying to keep a low profile. I don't want to be exposed to anything. I don't want you to think I'm just laying out of church. And to both of them I said this. You just do what you have to do. And you don't worry about it. Here's the other thing I find in this particular part of the text. You still with me? Okay. God never told Abraham not to go to Egypt. That's what I want to say to the commentator. Yeah, okay, but God didn't tell him not to go. Hello? God didn't tell him. Now, God's led him every step. He didn't tell him not to go to Egypt. I believe the steps of a good man have order by the Lord. But I don't believe God necessarily gives every one of us turn-by-turn directions every day. I don't believe he's your GPS. I'm glad he's not my GPS. The only thing mine ever tells me is turn around. As soon as possible, make a U-turn. I just turn it off. But here's the confidence I do have in the decisions I make every day. He has promised that he's able to keep me from stumbling. 
And while he may not give me turn-by-turn directions on every decision I have to make, I promise you he will show up if I'm making the wrong decision. And if I'm choosing the wrong path, his Holy Spirit will quicken and prompt me and say, "Uh uh-uh, not this one, not this one, not there. He may not say every one to take, but he'll keep me from taking the wrong one because he's able and promised to preserve me and to keep me from stumbling and present me spotless before the throne of God. So then I had this personal thought. God, why did you bring Abram to Canaan just before the famine hit? Why didn't you just leave him in in Haran until the famine was over? Y'all don't ever think these things? Why, Why did you bring him there then? The famine's coming. Why didn't you leave him alone? until the famine was over, and then let him come. It'd still be Canaan, right? God, I got this figured out. If you'd listen to me. (laughs) Then I heard the Lord begin to talk. Maybe this isn't nearly so much about Abram in Egypt as it is three or four generations from now when another group of people is going to be in Egypt. Three or four generations from Abram, there's going to be another famine in the land. And the only place for food is going to be in Egypt. And maybe this isn't so much about me keeping Abram in Egypt. Maybe this is about me teaching Abram's descendants that you're going to go to Egypt too. And you're going to be in Pharaoh's house too. But look, I kept Abram when he was there and I can keep you when you're there. See, here's what we have to understand. Everything's not about us. There's another generation who is coming behind us and another generation behind them. And they've got steps in their lives as well. And some of our battles are not about us, but they're so that when our children and grandchildren have their battle, they can look back and say, wait a minute, I remember when Papa went through this, God was able to keep him. I remember when Nana went through this, God was able to sustain him. And if God will sustain them, he will sustain me as well. All right, all right. Sometimes you just do what you got to do. But, there was a but in that text. But, don't ever do what you shouldn't do. Sometimes you do what you got to do. That's kind of scary because kids will use that as an excuse. Why'd you do that? Well, Daddy Preacher said. Sometimes you just do what you got to do. Well, here's what else the preacher said. Sometimes you do what you got to do, but you don't ever do what you shouldn't do. I want you to think about this. Abram is he's over 75 years of age, but he is still young in his journey with God. He's still young in his journey with God. And we are about to find out that God is more patient with us than we are with other people. Oh, I have preached now. God is more patient with us than we are with other people. Abram is afraid. Now here's Abram's problem. Boy, I love this text. Oh my goodness. Abram, like a lot of us, is married to a good-looking woman. All right, there it was, man. You had your shot. That's where you look at your wife and say, he's talking to me. (laughs) Abram is married to a good-looking woman. And the Egyptians were attracted to the women of Mesopotamia. They thought there wasn't anybody else like them. And Abram realizes the only thing between me and these Egyptian men and this beautiful woman, the only thing between them is me. And he was afraid. So he lied. Now, in actuality, it was a half lie. Because Sarah was his half-sister. 
I don't even want to get into that. <laughs> another day, another era. Don't even want to go there. But she was his half-sister, so some would say, well, it's just a half-lie. A half-lie is a lie. You can't dig half a hole. Come on. You cannot dig half a hole. Because once you dig it, it's a hole. You can't tell half a lie. Because once you tell it, it's a lie. Now stop for a minute and think. Because Abram is not. Look at the potential mess he is making in his life. Doing what he shouldn't do. First of all, this boy is about to mess up his marriage royally. Can I get an amen? He's essentially telling Sarah, Pharaoh is a killer and he might kill me. I don't want him to kill me, but I don't care what he does to you. Amen. So you go live in his house and tell him you're my sister. You go subject yourself to him. Sarah, you go do what you got to do. But doing what you got to do is no excuse for doing what you shouldn't do. And I'm sitting there thinking, if somehow Sarah survives this, it's going to be a long ride home to Canaan. Oh, come on now. It's going to be a long ride home. If somehow she survives this, the first time she sees Abram and he comes running up, she's going to say, "Uh uh-uh, don't go there. Don't talk to me. I'll tell you when you can talk to me again. He's really putting his marriage at stake because he's doing what he shouldn't do. Who's hearing me? Not only is he putting his marriage at stake, he's putting the promise of God at stake. Because the promise of God was, I'm going to bless you and Sarah, and through her you will have a seed. And he's about to poison God's promise because he's doing what he shouldn't do. What is Abram's issue at this part in his journey? I see the runway. Hold on. Trust. Abram has a trust issue with God. Abram has a trust issue. He's not going to admit it, not going to proclaim it, but his actions tell a different story. Oh, I can preach now. Because you can, you, 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 you'll never admit it and you'll never proclaim it, but your actions will tell what you really believe. Your actions will tell where you really are in your relationship with God. Abram has a trust issue with God. Abram is not convinced he can fully trust God. Abram hasn't learned something we all need to learn. That God doesn't need our help. And God doesn't need us to plot and plan. And God doesn't need us to make excuses. And God doesn't need us to be strategizing. God didn't need Abram to cover for him in Egypt any more than he needs me or you to cover for him wherever we may be in our lives. What does he need us to do? He just needs us to trust him that he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we could ever ask, seek, or imagine. We need to trust that wherever he takes me in life or wherever life takes me. He's able to keep me. He's able to guard me. He's able to sustain me. He's able to provide for me. He's able. The psalmist said he can set a table for me right in the presence of my enemies. Think how annoying that is. Ah, Think how annoying that is. Your enemy wants to torture you. He wants you vexed with worry and fear and anxiety and stress. 
and yet in the circumstances all around that would bring those things to you naturally, God's able to set a table right in the middle of them and say, sit down here and let me feed you while the enemy watches. Sit down here and let me comfort you. Sit down here and let me sustain you. I'm able to set a table even in the middle of your enemies. Issues trust. Now, Sarai's taken to the palace. Exactly what Abraham thought. She is not immediately taken to Pharaoh. If you remember the story of Esther, when she was chosen to be queen, she went through a season of preparation before she would be presented to the king. Sarai's taken, and there's going to be a season of preparation before she's presented to Pharaoh as wife. But as she is in the palace waiting, the Egyptians notice something's wrong. Or as we say in Six Mile, something ain't right, boys. <laughs> something ain't right. As Grandma used to say, something don't feel right. Anybody have that, Grandma? Anybody have that, Mama? Mama? You come in, maybe you've been somewhere you wasn't supposed to be. And they're waiting on you saying, mm, something ain't right, boy. You're wondering which one of your friends ratted out on you. Something ain't right. The Egyptians start to look at one another. Something's not right. Among their people, there begins to be calamity and sickness and disease. The Bible calls it plagues. And the Egyptians look at one another. This is, something's not right. I don't know what it is, but I know when it started. It started when that woman got here. Something ain't right. And I made myself a note. Oh, Lord, for the discernment of the Egyptians... To be able to know when something's not right. Amen. I ain't worried about knowing it in your life. I'm worried about knowing it in my life. Oh Lord, for the discernment of the Egyptians. See, the Bible doesn't say that an angel showed up at Pharaoh's house and said, Hey boy! Doesn't say there was a vision from heaven. It just says plagues broke out among the Egyptians and they discerned something is not right. God, help us discern our missteps that we might correct them before it's too late. Pharaoh calls Abram, here, take her. He sends him on his way. He tells all of G Egypt, leave her alone. Let me make a note here. When Pharaoh took Sarah... He gave Abram gifts, we read in our text. Male and female donkeys, camels, male and female servants. And among the female servants that he gave to Abram was a woman named Hagar. Yeah. Yeah. Doing what you shouldn't do, you might wind up with relationships and attachments that will be a thorn in your flesh for years to come. Can I do a mic drop? Is this? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get a mic drop meme and I'll cue you when to put it up there. Doing what you shouldn't do. You may think you get away with it, but you might wind up with relationships and attachments that become thorn in your flesh. For years to come. Amen. The problem wasn't that Abram went to Egypt. The problem was Abram didn't trust God to keep him in Egypt. He was doing what he had to do. But then he did what he shouldn't have. Revealing his mistrust for God. So how do we put this in our lives today? 
Well, here's what I believe. I believe all across this room and all across the internet, there are scores of people who find themselves in places and circumstances they never thought they'd be in. They might have thought this season of life would come. They just didn't perceive the reality of it. Their perception was probably better than the reality of it. Is anybody hearing me? The perception of it was probably better than the reality of it. I believe there are people in this room who are widowed, who had a perception of what it might be like, but you had no idea of its reality. I believe there are people in this room who are divorced. I believe there are people who are entangled in sin, who had a perception of what it might bring you, but you had no idea what the reality of it would be. I believe there are people in this room who have rebelling children. You, you had an idea what you thought it might be like. You had no idea what it is like. I believe there are people in this room and on the internet who are in seasons of failing health. And they had a perception that they knew this body wouldn't last forever. They just didn't know the reality of what a struggle it could become. Is anybody hearing me today? And I can go on and on and on and on of the circumstances that I believe and I, I, I feel very confident by the Spirit that are true. Here's what he sent me to tell you today. God doesn't need you to figure your own way out of wherever you are. Amen. God doesn't need you strategizing. That doesn't mean you don't listen to doctors. That doesn't mean you don't listen to people who can help you. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is God doesn't need you strategizing yourself. He doesn't need you coming up with a way to cover for God. And he doesn't need you to make excuses for where he's brought you to. All he needs you to do is trust him. Amen. He was with you in Canaan. He'll be with you in Egypt. You can trust him. He was with you when you're on the mountain. He'll be with you. When you're in the valley, you can trust Him. 